This is the series we've been in here called Trigger, and uh, I want to give a big shout out before we begin today to our Clearbrook campus. Come on, we give a great big hand clap to Clearbrook. <laughs> Welcome on board today, Clearbrook, and uh, we're excited to have each and every one of you here with us today. We have been in a powerful series, as I said just a moment ago, called Trigger. And through this series, we have come and talked about some issues that we all get triggered about, one time or another. And we've been talking about this in essence of saying, listen, we're coming to confront and face the triggers of pain, emotions, and lies with Jesus' help to overcome them, right? Jesus changes everything, doesn't he? That's what we just sang about. We believe that. So the first week, those of you that were with us was on substance abuse. Then we talked on politics. Last week was on mental wellness. Susie Tasker did an amazing job. Go back and take a look at that video from last week. You can look at all these videos. And then today is on racial unity. And I want to welcome my good friend, Telvin Howe, to Abundant Life Church today. Come on, would you give a great big hand clap? Telvin and I worked together for a number of years on staff at our previous churches together, and uh, it was an amazing ride. We did so much crazy stuff together, man, in ministry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we traveled, and we sought the Lord together, and we saw God do amazing things. We had a lot of fun in it as well. So I'm so glad you're here with us today. And um, I just want to tell a little bit about yourself, what God is doing. There's exciting things happening in your world. Yeah. That uh, we are just so, so welcome to Abundant Life, Telvin. All right. Thank you for having me again. And I just want to just commend you, uh, Pastor John, here for this, this series, because I think what the world is longing for is to see, because I think there's been this disconnect between Sunday and Monday mm. and yeah. how the gospel really connects with real world. And yeah. these are real world issues that, I mean... Yeah. I mean, if I was to ask you to raise your hand, how many of you deal with any of these issues, you know, you either know someone or you have someone in your household is dealing with it. So thank you for being just really taking the time to talk about it. But I'm excited to be here. My wife, uh, she's going to be here second service. So I'm married, have two boys. Yes. Um, so I'm sorry you can't see them this service. But maybe <laughs> if you stick around for the next, you can see them. Um, to good. do that. But yeah, like Pastor John said, we've served on staff together down in Hampton, Virginia. And just recently, um, my wife and I have taken a new endeavor. We were, I was on staff at that church about 20 years. And, um, and someone told me earlier, you don't look that old. I'm like, I'm going to be like 43 in a couple weeks. So, uh, you know, Looking and good, so man. thank you. You know, I'm still, you know, waiting for my growth spurt here. You know, I'm just, you know, <laughs> I mean, I feel like a little midget, you know, just kind of, you know, uh, like a little kid on a swing, you know, <laughs> but I'm drinking milk. So, I mean, I'm, I mean, it, it tells me it's supposed to do a body good, but I'm still waiting on it. But um, so recently, my wife and I, as Pastor John was saying, we have a new exciting thing. After being on staff at the church for about 20 years, uh, last year, we just felt like our season was up. We felt like God said, it's time to go. And um, I kind of felt like Abraham because he didn't tell us where to go. Um, it was like, okay, Lord, time's up. So I resigned and kind of was like, okay, like what's next? And so we were trying to debate, do we, do we start something? Do we take over a church? Because we really felt a call to, you know, that we're supposed to pastor. And, um, mm. and about November, you know, probably in the fall of last year, around this time, yeah. we felt like the Lord said, plant a church. Uh, there have been things that God had placed in our heart when it comes to reconciliation and diversity and unity, racial unity. Mm. And so we felt like, okay, God, let's do this. And so uh, about November, we started putting together a team kind of there. And, um, and to make a long story short, in February, we launched Emmaus Church in Hampton, Virginia. Awesome. So we're six months Ooh, old. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and the crazy thing about it is this. Uh, we did everything that you're not supposed to do, they tell you, in church planning world. <laughs> um, you know, you're supposed to take like a year and longer and things, but God has just been so faithful. I mean, we pretty much with a small team, about 20 to 30 people and, you know, $3,000. <laughs> that was for what we raised from those people. We launched a church and, and, um, and God has been so good and so faithful with what he's doing down in Hampton. So. Man. I'm excited for you guys. What a step of faith. Yes. I'm going to tell you what, Telvin has done it all in ministry. I'm telling you what, this guy <laughs> is well-versed in ministry. You've had a, held about every position. I'm, I'm, I mean that. And it's been incredible to see God use you. 
and take you to plant uh, in Mayus, and uh, we love you for that. So thankful for you and Rebecca and your family doing it. Yes, it's a huge thank step you. of faith. Well, today as we come, we're going to talk about racial unity, and uh, you like the first one I thought about uh, when I thought about this topic. You and I have worked together, and uh, and just coming to understanding this is this can be a trigger for many for many people. Pe- many people get triggered over racism. And we need to talk about this, and, and uh, we need to converse about this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think Satan has done a great job in dividing us through racism. That's for sure. We've allowed him to do this in our lives. But I believe the church can be a place to help alleviate racism. How many of you believe that? Yeah. The church, through the body of Christ, can be that place. Some of the very heart you have in planting Emmaus as well. So... Today, I just want us just to lean in and establish a posture to love better. You know, not only in this church, but people that are listening all over. And uh, some questions, just as we thought through this as our creative team, and uh, so many things came to mind. But what can we do to promote racial unity? What are those areas we can really work on? Yeah, that's a good question. And first, I want to just, again, commend because... This is where it starts, I think, for you to be able to talk about it and tackle it, because it is a trigger. I mean, the moment that, you know, you heard the word racism, there are probably feelings that came up in each and every one of us um, that we have. And what I like to say is what we could do to promote racial unity. I like to say simply um, it's this arc, I guess you could say. I I heard this acronym a little bit ago, arc, and it's awareness, relationships, commitment. What it means is, number one, awareness, that we need to take the time to learn because there's a lot of things that we don't know. And so I think as individuals taking the time to learn, to, to learn the things that are out there, because there's a lot of insti- uh, institution and systematic racism that just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not going on. Wow. And I think becoming aware. Uh, the second thing is relationships, that each and every one of us should have someone outside of our comfort zone or someone who's a different eth- ethnicity, a different race, have a different background than we do, that we could have conversations, meaningful conversations that we could ask. If we don't understand, mm. just be able to ask. A funny, really quick story. My wife's not in here, so I'll share. Um, <laughs> my wife is Hispanic. Uh, she's from Guatemala. And so, um, and so it's been interesting. We've been married now for going on 15 years. And the interesting part is she had to learn a lot just about black African-American culture. I mean, and so I love about her. If she don't know, she'll ask, you know, and, and my sister and her are really good friends. And she'll just call her. She'll say, you know what? I was at the park and, you know, I saw this this African-American lady and she looked at me and she looked at me with a side eye. And what does that mean? And my sister will laugh and says, you know, she's like, was, what, what, was you doing anything crazy? She says, no. She's like, well, she, you know, she just had an attitude. You know, just different <laughs> stuff, you know. Just, but, but learning just to have those conversations. My wife has someone in her life where she could just ask those questions. Uh, she has white friends that she could just ask, hey, you know, if I go into the store and, you know, they say this, like, what does that mean? Oh, okay. That's it. Oh, fine. Okay. You know, and so doing that. And then the last thing is a commitment, a commitment to that when we become aware and we have those relationships that we need to speak up for the injustices that's in this world. Um, And I think that's a big thing is that for so long, I think the churches remain quiet on a lot of issues. And I personally, I believe that God has given the church a second opportunity to do something um, because I believe in the civil rights movement, the church was largely absent. And I believe that this is a moment in time that God has given us as the body of Christ to stand up and show the world that Jesus is real. Amen. And so I I believe that. that. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Those are great. ARC, A-R-C on that. Good stuff. Um, I think as we come to this topic, like you said, there's many things we don't understand. And, um, so we don't embrace it. It could be fear. It could be ignorance. It could be a number of things, whatever. It, may, it, it can go way deep. But what is it that we don't understand about racism in America? Yeah, I think the thing that we, we don't understand, and let me take it back to something you said. I think, number one, we have to ground it in the reality that, um, that it is a sin and it's from the devil. Mm-hmm. 
Um, if you if you look, division, I think, is the last hurdle, uh, the last calling card that the enemy uses. If you look in the Garden of Eden when God created man, Satan did two things. He separated man from God and separated man from one another. I mean, you think about it, you know, when God said, hey, Adam, where are you? I mean, there was a loss of relationship with God. But then right after that, there was this there was this re- division between man. I mean, we see it, Cain and Abel. Right after that, Cain and Abel, the, the, there. And then you see these divisions that go on. And so the enemy continuously uh, uses that because that's that's the oldest trick in the book. And, that, and it works. So I think we must understand that that is uh, uh, from the enemy, but we also must understand that it's part of the gospel, that reconciliation and and is part of the gospel. Mm -hmm. If you begin to go through scripture and you begin to look, you have to begin to understand that this isn't something, because I think for so long the church has separated and said this stuff is social gospel, and then there's the real gospel over here, and understanding that the whole thing is the gospel. Yeah. You can't separate it. I mean, you even look, and I know I'm trying to take it a roundabout way, but I want to establish that this is something that's biblical. If you look at the encounter that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman at the well, there's a lot more in that story that meets the eye. I mean, to think about it, the woman looks at Jesus, and she perceives that he's not from around there. How does she know that? Because Jesus must have looked different. There must have been something, a different dialect, a different skin tone, that they knew the difference between Samaritans and Jews. But yet Jesus talked to her. But then you look at the language that was there. She said, you know, you people say, I mean, you people, if that's not racist language right there, I mean, you you know, she's like, you people say that, you know, this. But, you know, but the way that Jesus embraced her and crossed over and really, I mean, it was just an incredible, incredible thing. And you go through scripture and you see these examples, but then you go to the God, you go to Paul. Um, you know, matter of fact, the interesting part here, if you study, the first time that the word Christians was used was at the church of Antioch. The church of Antioch was the most diverse church in the book of Acts. And so I think we must understand that. But I think another thing moving on now to the question is what we don't know is I think we have to understand the civil rights movement was only in the 1950s and 60s. And so to completely think that there's a whole generation of individuals that lived through that. There's some of you out here that was alive during that time. So there is a whole generation there that that very much the pain and very much the attitudes and the things that it is very real. My father, my father lived through a lot of that. And so there's things that he can't watch and he can't because it it triggers mm. things inside of him. And so to understand that it is very much real and we see lots of things today and and we think that oh man something's going on. It's always been there. We just have social media where everybody's business can now be put on the street. Yeah. And so but it's never truly went away. It's just kind of taken a different form. Mm. And I think we have to understand that that you know um, just because something may not be overtly racist doesn't mean that it's not that racism isn't there. Mm, and true. so I think that's the big thing to understand is that there's system and structures that are in place that will keep and hold and oppress people. That And those are the things that we have to deal with and speak up as the church. Mm, that's so good. I love that. Wow. You know, um, like you're saying, growing up, your father experienced things uh, that uh, you never did and uh, I would never go through, I'm sure. But the thing is, is what are those underlying biases that you grew up with or maybe even you still experience today when it comes to racism? Yeah, you know, um, first, I I should have said this earlier. This is something that really this conversation isn't going to, you know, in a 30-minute window I mean, it's so much more, and the conversation needs to continue. But um, I think all of us, if we understand, number one, we all have biases. We all have things that birth from our experiences. And I grew up, you know, I think for me, I like to say I'm a miracle because with everything that my dad went through, um, he was born in Georgia. So, you know, down in Georgia, down in the south uh, where things are very real. And so even to this day, I'll share a quick story. Last year, we went to Georgia for a family reunion. And so I wanted to take my boys because they had never been, and we wanted to take them to the cemetery where my grandmother and my grandfather were buried. And so as we go to the cemetery, first off, 
you could notice there's a stark difference because half of the cemetery is just, I mean, it's dirt. It's just, it's messed up. Another half is nice and pretty. And down the middle is this fence. And so we walk over and we go and we're over there. And my boys, uh, both at that time, they were eight and six. They asked, they said, well, what's, what's over there? Why is that clean over here and this not? And why the fence? You know, because, you know, at that age, they just ask everything's a question, you know. You know, why is the rock round? You know, why is the ground, you know, everything. And my dad looks and he says, so, he says, you know, son, that's the white half of the cemetery. And that's, this is the black side. And he just kind of looked and it just didn't compute with him. And um, he says, black and white? He says, but the fence. And the sad thing about it is the fence was new. Here it is, 2018, and there's still a stark difference. And you ask anybody there, they will tell you, this is the white half, this is the black half. And, I mean, even then, there's still, I mean, we see all the time, and in our area, especially just even last week, there was a football team that had to, they got suspended, had to forfeit a game because of racist videos that were made. Um, you know, I mean, so we still have it. And even myself, um, I, I've experienced lots of things. But I think that God has spared me because my dad went into the military and we were able to travel the world. And so a lot of the, the, the things that I could have experienced, and I've experienced lots of things. I mean, I could stand up here all day and share with you just uh, racist things that have happened to me even, you know, just as, and I'll share just one that happened just a couple of weeks ago. Um, but, you know, I was able to meet people from all different backgrounds and walks of life. And so for me growing up at an early age, my father traveling, I just saw the beauty of diversity. Mm. I just saw the enrichment of having just different people yeah. in my life. And so for me, I, I get, I get, you know, I love diversity so much that if I'm in a place that's all one color, I start to get a little nervous because I, I need a little diversity, whether it's all black, whether it's all white. I'm looking like, man, I, where's, where, where the, where's the color at? Or where's the, you know, where, where's the stuff at? Because, because I'm so used to it, the beauty of diversity, the enrichment of it. But just to share the story I was saying, what's, what's happened to me, and just to kind of show you things that we may not take as racist, but when you're not on the other end of it and you don't understand then it's hard for you to kind of picture these things. Yeah. So I'm going, I got invited. There's an individual at the church. He was retiring from the military. And so he asked me if I would come and kind of pray and speak at his retirement ceremony. Um, he's a chaplain assistant and everything. And so people who know me know that I have one suit, and that is the Mary Berry suit. <laughs> so um, you will not see me in a suit I mean, you, you won't see me. I mean, you're lucky. Like, if you see me in a suit and I come visit you, people are like, am I okay? Like, is everything, you know? Uh, you know? And so, I'm, I'm, so I put on my suit, and, I'm, and I had to go get some gas at 7-Eleven. So I run in to pay for the gas, and there is a, there's an older white lady behind the counter, and she looks at me. She says, well, what did you do? Wow. Well, for anybody, some of you may think, well, that's, that's not offensive. But let me tell you what she was insinuating. She was insinuating that the only time that African-American males dress up is when they go to court. Wow. And I look at her and I said, ma'am, I didn't do anything. I said, matter of fact, a member of my church is retirement, retiring and I'm speaking at his retirement ceremony. And she kind of, oh, and then she kind of goes and does her way. Mm. But it's things like that that happen on a consistent basis every day that we don't realize and recognize that, you know, are aware. And what we tend to tell people is get over it. And get over it is the worst thing that you could do and tell somebody because what you're telling them is their story doesn't matter. And when you tell them that their story doesn't matter, you tell them you don't matter. And you destroy their dignity. And so I think we have to, you know, I know I'm kind of going all over the place, but this is something that's just, that's in my heart. So I'm sorry, go on. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> no, you're doing good. You know. You always know when you got a pastor up here, you can take care of it. He's tied. <laughs> you know, so. That's great. I love that. I, and that question comes from like, because we don't understand uh, many times on average what 
are, those things that we don't understand about racism and the biases that we don't, like you're saying, we sometimes wouldn't even think about it. We just think from maybe our family of origin, well, that's how I heard my parents talk yeah. or my aunt and uncle talk. And so it had to be right or I just accepted it as right and it's really wrong yeah. and it doesn't represent God well. And I think, and sometimes well-meaning, and uh, I'll just say this, one of the things I, I will tell individuals that will come and well-meaning, they'll, they'll tell me, well, I don't see color. And I will tell you this, that is one of the most offensive things that you could tell someone of diversity. Mm -hmm. Because what you're telling them is, is that you don't recognize who they are as an individual. Yeah, I want you to see color. Yeah. I want you to see my color. Amen. Because right. this is how God made me. I am an individual yeah. made in the image of God, and I want you to see it. Yeah. And so I think, and you know, and that's, if you've said that in the past, hey, that's nothing to you, but I just want you to know that, you know, change the diet, change the thought process to not say, I don't see color. Say you do see color, and you appreciate the uniqueness of how God created so, the individual. Right. That's right. That's a lot, I love that. I love that. That's some great stuff. That is so, so good. It's so rich. Um, it is, this is what we're saying. We're honoring the image of God in one another. You know, that's what we're saying, intentionally honoring the image of God. So what, what do you think as it comes to this topic? What is the difference between tolerating things and then active unity? Yeah, that's a good question. As I was chewing on that, I was thinking, you know, because we hear a lot now about tolerating things. And I think, and I'll give you my opinion, I think the difference between tolerating and active unity, I tolerate something because I have to. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, like my kids sometimes, they do things and I tolerate it because, you know, I just don't feel like, I mean, I pick and choose my battles. I mean, those of you that have, <laughs> those of you who have kids, I mean, you know, Amen. you know the deal. You know, you just, you just tolerate it because you just don't feel like you, that's not a hill that you want to die on. <laughs> right. And so we tolerate something, not, we don't embrace it. We just kind of put up with it. And I think, you know, uh, and when it comes to this thing of racism, there's a lot of people that just kind of, they tolerate it. You know, okay, we'll talk about it, but, you know, because I don't really mm -hmm. feel like whatever. But active unity means this, that I, I don't tolerate, I don't put up with it because I have to. I embrace it because I believe that it's part of who I am. It's because I love, I want to see rights made wrong, and that I understand that we're all made in the image of God. And as believers, we're called to love one another. We're called to love God. We're called to love one another. Mm. If we have this belief system that, man, how can we say, I mean, you, I love the way that, you know, First John puts it, how can we say that we love God, but we can't even love our brother and sister who, mm. who are down mm. here? You know, so they'll know we're Christians by our love. Right. And so I think that that's the thing between active unity is that it, it's birthed from an attitude not of I have to, but it's birthed from an attitude of love. Mm, so true. So true. I, I was I was thinking about this last week out of Ephesians 2. And I know you mentioned the church at Antioch, but in the midst of the Roman Empire marked by severe prejudices, hatred, the first Christians they viewed themselves as part of a worldwide family that transcended national, class, cultural, and racial barriers. That they understood that through Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ that was shed that we sang about today had destroyed these barriers to create a new human race, a new society, a new people, the church. And so that's what Jesus is about. That's what we're about. That's what we're called to be as the body of Christ, as the local church. So... When we give our hearts to Jesus, like you just said, it is in essence, you're giving your heart to one another. Mm -hmm. That is what it's about. Plain and simple. We give our hearts to the Lord. We're, we're dying to our thought patterns on things, and we're taking on this new identity. And we're coming and saying, man, and I'm going to give my heart to others that are not like me. Yeah. And uh, that's, what, that's uh, so important. And we have a young generation, which you're well aware of, Shelvin. I know this as you're ministering to them is that millennials, Gen, Gen Zers are so passionate for racial unity. Yeah. So passionate out there to speak up for it and to get in the middle of it. And it's just amazing. This comes about again. We see this generation after generation, but they're passionate about it. 
you see a lot of that as well in the Hampton area? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, again, there's so much, I mean, there, there's just so much with this generation, I mean, has gone through and what they see. But I, I like to say there's so much passion inside of them that they have this, this heart for, for justice. I, I think a lot of it is because yeah. this is probably, this generation's more connected than we ever will be. I mean, you know, they could go to Japan in seconds just on a tablet and be talking to a friend in, in, in Japan. I mean, I have a nephew of mine, and he loves Japanese. Uh, I don't know how he, how he got it, but he loves it. And so he has a friend that he talks to. I mean, I mean, just on a tablet. I mean, you could just, right now, I could pick up this phone, and I could probably go anywhere in the world. I mean, uh, growing up, I, hey, you would have had to, you know, number one, think about the phone, you know, the long distance. If you ain't have that long distance phone plan, <laughs> you're not even calling the next state, you know. Um, you know, how many of y'all remember that? You had to get the long distance phone plan. Some of you individuals are like, what, long distance phone plan? <laughs> I think, some, some people remember collect calls. Yeah, you know, collect <laughs> calls. I mean, you know. And so I think this generation is. But I think this is also a generation that's coming up. You know, I think that if we could really, I'll, take, I'll just say this, yeah, a generation sorry. that's coming up in the church, mm. they're reading scripture and they're taking it for face value. Mm. That this is what it says. When Paul says that God has tore down the dividing line of hostility and there's neither Jew nor Gentile yes. and that we're all okay, well, why is there a divided line in the church? This ain't right. And so they're taking the scripture at face value, and they're saying, hey, if this is what the Bible says, then why aren't we doing it? And, 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 they're, and they're challenging the status quo. And I, think, um, and I think that's what's needed. I think this generation, um, we're going to see, a lot of people say, well, this generation is way out there. I think that, man, if they, if they really get a hold of scripture mm. and get a hold of what, this says, I mean, I think this will be the generation that will usher in one of the greatest movements. And I'll say this, and, and I know I'm going to, no, yeah. he's going rogue. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, but I will say this, and, and this thing, I think that we have not seen as the church, we always talk about Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. But I believe we have not really truly seen the full effect of that. Because if you look at when it came, if you, if you break it down and study it, it says that each and every individual, it names all these nations around that was present. And a lot of times we, we take, well, those are just Jewish individuals. But if you dig a little deeper, there were more than just Jewish individuals that was in that crowd. But there were nations that were represented from Africa, from your different nations there. But the first thing that happened when the Holy Spirit fell, it said that these individuals said, I hear the gospel in my language. That the Holy Spirit wasn't created and fell. The day of Pentecost, well, even if you study Pentecost, Pentecost is about harvesting. Mm. And it isn't about the church standing in church on Sunday, getting these goosebump fillings. But the purpose of the Holy Spirit, even God gave a warning up front. He said, and you will be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. And right there, when the Holy Spirit fell, you saw the manifestation of that, where you had people there from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring in that end time harvest so that every nation, Every tribe, every color, every ethnicity mm. will hear the gospel of so Jesus Christ. Good. And so, um, so good, so good. Um, we kind of have asked every week just on this issue of resources because so many people come to this topic and they're like, hey, where can I find good resources? What, what should I look at when it comes to this area of racial <laughs> unity? Um, do you have any resources that you'd like to share with us uh, that we could go to and look at? Yeah, I think sometimes it becomes overwhelming um, to, to do this. Um, and so I think number one is just a, a resource is just begin just to study your word. Uh, study and begin to look and read the book of Acts, read Ephesians and read and get this thing of, okay, this is what the gospel is. But I think begin to watch documentaries, read some books. I tell you, a great book uh, is called The Myth of Equality. That's by a Ken, what, um, it's like what's Mata or whatever. Just a, It's one of those hard pronouncing last names, and I don't want to say it because I think I may curse trying to say it. Um, but it's called The Myth of Equality. 
Um, there is another book out there called Divided by Faith, which is an incredible book uh, written by Dr. Michael Emerson, um, who's a professor at Baylor. And he's a white professor that wrote you from Baylor. Okay, hey, you know, and so, um, and he talks about the divide between the white and the African American church. Um, the Color of Compromise is a great book that just came out. That's a great book. Um, I think there are some documentaries that you could watch. Um, I think just begin to just, you know, as much, things like that. I mean, there's a wonderful documentary on, um, I know some of you, you may look at it, but it's a documentary. Chelsea Handler just did a documentary on Netflix, um, and it's called Hello, It's Me, Privilege. And I think it's an incredible, you may not like Chelsea Handler or whatever, and excuse some of the stuff there, but I think it, it's good to begin to hear stuff. Because I think what happens is, when, and, and I want to encourage you that when you begin to watch things and you begin to see things, when it gets hard, don't stop. Because I think as human tendency is, when things are difficult, we turn away because we get overwhelmed. But we have to push through to see the ugliness, to see the atrocities, to see those things. So you're going to read things in some of these books, and they're going to feel overwhelming. But I want to encourage you, begin to confront the biases or why they feel overwhelming to you and push through. And when you do, I believe you'll see something that's beautiful from it. Yeah. Um, even just learning, even history, um, most people don't realize a very significant event happened in Virginia just a couple of weeks ago. It was the 400-year commemoration of the slaves' first landing um, in Hampton. And many people, for us, it was a very significant event because um, most people think the slaves landed in York, Jamestown. They didn't. They landed in Hampton, Virginia. And so just taking the time to learn that, man, Virginia, this is something that happened. And the reason why God even, I feel like, birthed a, for us to plant a church is we feel like from that one event from Hampton, Virginia, there was so much hatred, mistrust, so much that was birthed from there. How beautiful would it be to have a church that is diverse, that is multi-generational, multi-ethnic, that is birthed from the same place where that was birthed that, that we could change the narrative of our country. And so, but this happened right in Virginia. This is our own history here. So even taking the time to learn those things would just be an incredible thing. Like for instance, and I know I've, I'm, 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 I'm wrapping up, uh, <laughs> but even taking the time to learn, I know recently the big controversy is 4th of July. But taking the time to learn, you know, and I'm, and I'm not I'm not against 4th of July or any of that thing. But I would encourage you, if you celebrate the 4th of July, learn about Juneteenth. And some of you are like, what? I'll challenge you. Look that up, Juneteenth. Most people don't realize it's June 19th, uh, 1865. And that's when the final slaves, slavery was abolished in this country in Texas, which was the last outlying place that slavery was had. I think that's something to be celebrated. Amen. You know? Amen. And so, but learning things like that will help educate you and will help put those things in your hand. So, yeah. That's okay. Great. And another one, which I know that uh, I got to hear Pastor uh, Miles McPherson last year, uh, Rock Church out of San Diego. He's got a book called The Third Oh, the third, yeah, The Third Option the third is option a good one. Yeah, I read that one. I sat in a conference when he was talking about this book and he made a statement that was so profound. He said, you know, we celebrate a tan. When you get a tan at the beach, it's beautiful. But when you get a tan in the womb, it's criminalized. That's a powerful statement, church. And we are not okay with racism because God is not okay with it. It's why he sent Jesus Christ uh, to this earth. And uh, to die, to bring, like you said, down the dividing walls, all of those things. Anything else, Telvin, would like to leave us with today? Yeah, I think if I could leave you with one final thought, I, I think if this thing is, don't let the conversation stop today. Find someone that you could have a conversation with, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and just tell them, hey, be real with them. Hey, you know, I don't know a lot, so I'm going to ask questions and give grace. I think for both, if you're the one, if you're the African-American, that you have a white person coming to you saying, I want to ask questions, give grace. Amen. If, you're, if you're white 
and, you know, and a black person comes to you, give grace. And I think we have to learn to give each other the benefit of a doubt to, to know, begin to remove the stereotypes in our own hearts to know that, number one, not every white person is a racist, and number two, not every black person is a thug and, 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 and those things. And so we have to remove the stereotypes in our own hearts because we all have those stereotypes. But I also think as the church, and this is something that I want to encourage, and, and I want you to hear me, especially for my white brothers and sisters. This is something that we need you. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., one of the saddest things he wrote from the, from the letters from Birmingham jail, he was very sad because a lot of his white brothers and sisters who were pastors and ministers stood opposed to what he was doing with the civil rights movement. And he believed that if they would have just stood up, that things would have been a whole lot different. And I think as, 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 our, as a black man, I can't champion this by myself. I need my white brothers and sisters to have those conversations, to stand up and to use the privilege that God, that, that they've been given and the power that they've been given and use that to make sure that everybody has that same power and privilege. And so I want to encourage you, take the time and educate, speak up. Because here's the thing, the opposite of hate, the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. And the church has become so indifferent to a lot of different things, not just racism, but a lot of different things. And so I want to encourage you, we need you, that we need you to, to learn, to be able to stand up and speak out because this is something that, you know what, we need to walk hand in hand to show the world that, hey, we, we have the answer. You can't legislate. I think that's the thing that's wrong. You can't legislate morality. And we've been waiting for the government to do it. And it's never been intended for the government to do it at all. And we as the church, we have the answer. We have the answer to it all. And if we as the church stand up, the sad thing is we're just as divided as outside. But if we were to come together walking hand in hand, imagine the revival that would happen in this country. Amen. And so. Hallelujah for that. Love that. Yeah. So good. I've asked Telvin to pray for us today before we go and all these things that God is working and doing something here. I sense that. Thank you for, for sharing your heart. Telvin, you pray for us as well. Yeah. Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for Pastor John and Kristen and this Abundant Life Church family that has decided that they're going to tackle these, some of these tough issues. And God, as we, we talk about racism, Lord, our country is bleeding. It's in pain, God. And Father God, there is a generation that is saying enough is enough. And Lord, I pray that, God, you would begin to work in all of our hearts, God. I pray that you would begin to point out the biases, the indifference in our own hearts, God. And I pray that we would put those things to death. And I pray that, God, you would send people into our lives that would help us, God. That would help us to, 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 to understand what's going on. And I believe, God, there is coming a day where the church is going to lead the charge, where we say enough is enough, that we will stand together and we will embrace the ministry of reconciliation that you have given us. That, Father, that we will reconcile, we will usher people into being reconciled back to you and thus being reconciled to one another, no matter the ethnicity, no matter the race. And so I thank you and I pray your blessings over each and every person. I pray that, God, from this day forward, I pray that, Lord, the things that they have heard, that, Lord, we, I know this, that when we hear, we're now responsible for what we've heard. And so I pray that, God, you would begin to lay a burden on their heart, Lord, to see justice, to see righteousness, God, done. In Jesus' name, amen.